Friends, I want to welcome you to this fifth Sunday of our Now and Not Yet series. I want to remind you of all the many things we've learned about the surety of God's power and that God will redeem all of creation, including us. And that we remember that Christ came for all. And that we are drawn into that world that Christ has given to us and offered to us and, and pictured for us. A time when God's reign rules supreme. And yet we know we're not quite there. We're still in this world. But we know it doesn't matter whether we know the precise time as long as we continue to live our lives being ready. Today, our message for us is that we live to be reconcilers in this world. I invite you to pray with me. Thank you, God, for bringing us together, even in these unique circumstances and through these methods that we have achieved. Grant us your grace to see one another and your world through your eyes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Action. Brothers and sisters, boys and girls, come and worship. Even if you are tired and worn out, come and worship. Lay down the heavy things you are carrying. Come and worship. Listen to what Jesus wants to tell you. Come and worship. See if you can discover how Jesus wants to use you. Come and worship. For Jesus is humble and gentle, and he will give us everything we need to follow him. Let's lift our voices joyfully together this morning as we sing our opening song, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling.
strength of his power. Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his power. Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his power. This year we held BBS in an abbreviated form in order to protect our children, youth, parents, and staff. During the last week of June, our Leewood UMC VBS team, led by Linda Zemke, helped guide our Knights of North Castle through their quest to be strong in the Lord. Even in the midst of a pandemic, God showed us all that if we put our faith in Him, He will help us defy our circumstances and walk through and above them.
meet you folks too. Hope to see you soon. And remember, try that number three setting. I think you're really gonna like it. Well, hi there. How are you folks doing? You stopped by the booth, so I'm assuming you like beards, right? <laughs> Fantastic. Hi, I'm Jeff, and I'm an ambassador for the GBC GKC SWD. <laughs> don't worry, I've been an ambassador for six months now. You don't have to worry about saying it that fast. What that is, that's the Graybeard Club of Greater Kansas City, Southwest Division. And we're mighty glad you stopped by. If you've got a minute, I'll just give you a little information about our club, and then someone else can talk to you if you have more questions. Well, we are a group of people who have gray beards, or people who, whose beards are starting to turn a little gray. We've actually got some folks who don't have any gray whatsoever in their beard, but they think it might turn gray. Well, shoot, we've got some people who don't even have beards at all, but they love beards. And that's the only thing you need to be a member of this club, because that's what we do. We talk about beards. Now we meet on the first Thursday of every month at a hair past eight o'clock. <laughs> I'm sorry, that just cracks me up every time I say it. At a hair past eight o'clock at the Whisker Palace in South Leewood. Now everybody just brings their beverage of choice and we sit around and we talk about all things beard. You might hear such exciting things as beard oil. Are there any new ones on the market? Conditioner, how much and how often should I use it? We even found out some fascinating things about beard combs last month. Well, I hope this has been helpful to you. And if you have more questions, we have other ambassadors that can spend time with you and answer all your questions. We can even arrange a ride for you if you'd like to come to the next meeting. Sure was a pleasure meeting you and we hope to see you soon. Take care. Well, hi there. Thanks for stopping by the booth. Can I help you with anything? Now, Charlie, I know you're going to ask, and no, I'm not a member of the Graybeard Club of Greater Kansas City Southwest Division. I just kind of made that up as an introduction as to what an ambassador is. An ambassador is somebody who represents a, a group or an organization or even a business, and they go out and they answer questions or they let the public know about their group. A lot of times they'll wear a special jacket or maybe a name tag, uh, maybe a shirt that has the name of the organization. And that way people know, oh, I can go talk to them about that. And it's a way for people to find out about that group. Now, did you know that the Bible says that we are ambassadors for Jesus? It's what it says. Well, if we're going to be ambassadors for Jesus, that means that we need to spend time learning about Jesus. And we can do that by reading the Bible, by praying, because that's how we spend time getting close to God. And it's very important to have meetings together, like with the Beard Club, and that's what Sunday school and church is all about. Because not only do you learn a topic each week, it gives you a chance to learn from each other and get close and share experiences. And that's a great way to learn and grow with each other. You see, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And then he rose from the grave three days later. Now he did that so that we can spend an eternity with God and with him in heaven. I mean, that's incredible. Because we are sinful people. And without Jesus doing that, there's no way that we could spend time with God. Because God is pure. So when Jesus did that, he paid the price for our sins so that we could spend that eternity in God with heaven. Now, heaven, beard club. Heaven, beard club. You saw how excited I was about the beard club. How excited should we be about being in the heaven club? That's pretty exciting, right? Well, now, when, when we become Christians and accept Jesus into our life, when we thank him for dying on the cross for our sins, when we ask him to be a part of our life, when we do that, we don't get a special jacket. People don't know that we're necessarily Christians by what we're wearing. But if we want to be an ambassador for Christ, we need to show it somehow. 
And the best way to do that is to model ourselves after Jesus by treating everyone the way that Jesus would want us to treat them. How would Jesus treat people? And that's what we need to do. And if we do that on a regular basis and people are watching, at some point, someone may come up and ask you, why do you act the way you do? And when they do, hopefully, you're going to be an excited ambassador for Jesus and tell them all about it. Let's have a quick prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending Jesus to die for our sins. We're not worthy of you, but we thank you for loving us so much that you did that. We ask that you be with us, that you help guide us, that you help us act the way that brings honor and glory to you. Help us to love everyone and to show that in our everyday lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
I'm reading from 2 Corinthians 5, 15 through 21. He died for the sake of all, so that those who are alive should live not for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. So then, from this point on, we won't recognize people by human standards. Even though we used to know Christ by human standards, that isn't how we now know him. So then, if anyone is in Christ, that person is part of the new creation. The old things have gone away, and look, new things have arrived. All of these new things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and who gave us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, God was reconciling the world to himself through Christ by not counting people's sins against them. He has trusted us with this message of reconciliation. So we are ambassadors who represent Christ. God is negotiating with you through us. We beg you as Christ's representatives, be reconciled to God. God caused the one who didn't know sin to be sin for our sake, so that through him we can become the righteousness of God. The Apostle Paul reminds the church of Corinth of the significance of Jesus' death and resurrection. The old ways were brought into focus, sharpened by his conviction that through death and resurrection, Jesus opened up a new future for the world. Paul celebrates the gospel of God's coming glory in such a way that it enters people's lives in very real, concrete, and particular ways, empowering them to join God's redemptive work in the world. Paul says, all who are alive should not live for themselves, but for the one who lived, died, and was raised. He told them to stop using human standards to measure themselves and others, inviting them to see others through God's eyes. It was this very thinking that allowed Dietrich Bonhoeffer to look at the guards in his prison camp, his tormentors, his captors, as someone for whom Christ died. This passage of scripture reminds us to live our call to reconciliation, to be part of God's reconciling work, redeeming the world. And as I say that, my mind is screaming at me, what does that look like today? Does that mean becoming anti-racist, anti-hate? Does it mean not sitting quietly when someone says hurtful, painful words or makes inappropriate comments? Maybe it means trying to find a way to speak truth that can be heard and be transformative, not simply by pointing fingers. The greatest lessons I have to admit that I've learned have come when someone is willing to hold up a mirror for me to see myself through their eyes. But it's hard. I heard a clergy mentor and a trainer confess that in his family, Everybody knows he's not ready to talk about his Sunday sermon until Tuesday. See, it's not easy for anyone to hear about themselves. But it's, if it's done through a depth of relationship, things can change. Becoming a follower of Jesus means being willing to withhold judgment on people. Imagine that. It's hard and it's tempting to throw scripture around to accuse and condemn, but Paul reminded folks, God was reconciling the world to himself through Christ by not counting people's sins against them. And he's trusted us with this message of reconciliation. We too are reconcilers, people who work to bring reconciliation, to begin to establish harmony between people including between ourselves and other people. And it all starts with being reconciled to God through Christ. That is exactly where harmony begins. I remember learning to play trombone in grade school. 
and I played in junior high too for a while. The band directors at those schools must have been saints. When my kids began to learn to play cello and violin, they improved and grew through kind words of direction. Imagine the many instrumental voices of a great symphony that works together, sharing their unique tones, their various levels of sound, creating beautiful music. By learning their part and hearing one another and following the guidance of the great conductor, they produce harmony that touches the heart and the soul. Otherwise, their sound has no purpose and descends into painful chaos. The Song of Life was written by God. To be a reconciler then, like a fine musician, requires a lifelong commitment to learning, growing, practicing, making mistakes, and starting over. Listening to the guidance and inspiration of God through Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Our Creator, our great conductor will guide us and sustain us and will in the end reconcile all, not just some, even through this time. Friends, today we come to the end of our five-week series now and not yet, but do we ever really come to the end? A place where we don't feel caught in a sort of between time, caught in that joyous possibility of God's coming reign on earth as in heaven, but still feeling the sorrows of human failings in us, around us, seemingly dragging us into darkness at times. Am I the only one who feels this way? Probably not. We are called to new life, to be reconcilers. But do we feel adequate up to the task? The true answer to that question lies in pondering where we focus. If I continue to stare inward and lament my condition, the cycle of despair will continue. What breaks us out of this feeling of numbness or inadequacy or fear? It's refocusing on our understanding of who God is, who Jesus is, how the Holy Spirit works, and remembering that others have been here before, and that we are all invited to the table of grace. All are welcome at Christ's table. Thanks be to God. On this weekend of July 4th, people across the country and from different backgrounds have traditionally come together around tables, picnic tables, kitchen tables, dining tables, and whether it was barbecue, fried chicken, mom's favorite homemade dish, or hot dogs, or a potluck, whatever it was in the pantry or whatever they could afford. Many pause to remember the founding value of independence and hopefully enjoy the company of friends and loved ones. But it is a different year, substantially different. And rightly so, for this year we pause to ask, our, ask ourselves, what is life giving? To gather or to safely distance? Will we think only of our own assumptions of safety, or will we understand the ramifications of our actions on the most vulnerable populations? Those who don't have a choice about going to work, those with compromising health conditions, those without health care, those black and brown people who are dying at higher rates. And more questions come up. What is freedom? an ideal to which we give lip service while ignoring the work we must do to truly enact the change that freedom requires? Or listening to the clarion call of the streets and the voice of the liberator Jesus, who bids us pray and work for God's reign here on earth, as it is in heaven, a place where there is a seat for all at the table. Together we gather around Jesus' table to remember what true freedom really means 
It's a table where outsiders and the least of these were invited. It's a table where the privileged also had a place, but were invited to let the seats of honor be given to those who had not previously been afforded access to them. All are invited to this table of freedom, the table of Jesus. You don't have to earn a seat, and you certainly don't have to fight for a seat. You simply have to accept the chair pulled up already for you. Yet as we prepare ourselves for this feast, we're called to admit the complexity that lies at the edges of our celebrations. Let us pray a prayer of confession. God, for all the ways we colonize each other with expectations, beliefs, judgments, and our own fear. God, in your mercy, forgive and transform. For all the ways we squander right relationship, grabbing to have more while some go without. God, in your mercy, forgive and transform. For all the ways we abuse our freedom, engaging hateful speech that injures and demeans. God, in your mercy, forgive and transform. For all the ways we deny equally, deeming some in and others out. In your mercy, forgive and transform. For all the ways we have fused and refused to let go of privilege, whining about how hard it is to change our ways, our systems, and our lifestyles. God, in your mercy, forgive and transform. Hear these words of assurance. Jesus said, I have come to set the prisoner free. No matter what binds you this day, freedom is yours through new life in Christ. We will continue to make mistakes, but the biggest one would be not to heed the call to try and try again. And so in the name of him who came to loose the chains, you are forgiven. I invite you to the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts with joy. Let us give praise to the author of freedom. It is right and a good and holy thing to give our praise to you this day, liberator of all humankind. You unleashed your creative power and a world blossomed. You bestowed upon every living thing, life and breath, color and movement. No matter how many battles we wage within and between ourselves and against you, your promise, vision, and gift of peace and abundance continues. And so we lift up our voices in celebration of you. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your son, Jesus. To those who are imprisoned by status, law, race, origin, illness, poverty, gender, age, disease, he said, your belief has set you free. You are a child of God. He invited disciples, friends, and strangers alike to his tables. He proclaimed God's grace to all with whom he broke bread. He proclaimed God's love to all with whom he shared the cup. And he told us to remember, repeating after me, Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let the people say, Amen. Would you pray with me? Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts 
of the bread and cup at each of our tables, which are part of your one table today. Transform this meal and transform this body so that we might be free to love without condition, to invite without hesitation, to go without reservation and proclaim your freedom to all the world. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Now I invite you to take the cup and the bread that you have at your table that you've prepared. In God's mind, this is one table. This is one table connected by the Holy Spirit, even though we cannot be present with one another. We are present through God's Spirit. And the blessing of God is upon all the tables and all the elements that you have gathered to share. So remember that on the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread and broke it and gave it to, the, to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup afterwards and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And so we remember. And if you are able to serve one another, serve one another. But know that Christ is with us as we commune with him and with one another. Thanks be to God. Will you join in our closing hymn this morning? One bread, one body.
Friends, today we have shared the bread and the cup. We have communed together as a people, as the body of Christ, and we're invited to leave this place as the body of Christ, to go and participate in the reconciling and redeeming work of Christ in this world. As much as we love the experience of being together to be Christ's body, we know we're called to be more to do more, to reach out, to love, and to participate in your transforming work of redemption. Go knowing that all you can do is be who you are in that truth, and love as Christ loves. For God will not leave you or forsake you. Go in peace.